Hi, I'm Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us for week number 15 of season 2 of Live with Annie. Can you believe it's the middle of April already? This year is just flying by. After a week of weather in the high 80s, we are back to chilly weather here in southern Utah. I had put all my plants outside a couple of weeks ago, and I was out there last night with towels covering them all up because our temperatures were already below freezing again. Let us know if springtime has arrived in your neck of the woods or if winter is still hanging around. Our viewers in Australia are just going into fall, which is always my favorite time of year, so all of you guys enjoy it for me. We want to thank everyone again for joining us because it's always a treat to see you here, um, our regular viewers, and to welcome new viewers too. We would ask if you enjoy these episodes, would you take a minute to give us some hearts or thumbs up, and also take a minute to follow us wherever you are watching. And if you know someone else who you think might enjoy the information that we share, we'd really love it if you'd tell them about Live with Annie. And one really easy way to do that is just to tag them while you're watching. That will take them directly to the episode so they can watch it too. And if tagging is new to you, all you do is type the at symbol followed by the name that they use on Facebook or YouTube, whatever, wherever you're watching them, click on it and then submit. Also, we really enjoy reading your comments, so please be sure to interact with us throughout this presentation. We really love to hear what you think and learn any tips that you can share too. Finally, if you have any questions as we go, please be sure to add them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them before we close. Last week, as part of our Biani bag making series, we talked about cutting. And that was cutting everything from fabric and soft and stable to vinyl, mesh, and fold over elastic. If you missed it, or if you want to watch it again, remember that all of the past episodes of Live with Annie are available online. There is a real wealth of information in all those episodes, and you can watch them on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, or by going to byannie.com slash live, L-I-V-E. We will put up all the links to make them easy for you to find. Over the past weeks of our Buy Annie Bag Making Basics series, we've talked about choosing fabric and supplies for your project, how to read a Buy Annie pattern, and we've shared tips and tricks for cutting. The next step in the process is generally quilt and cut. So today we are going to explore this handbag maker's question, to quilt or not to quilt? Quilting a stabilizer between the layers of fabrics enables you to easily make purses and bags from a wide variety of fabrics, including lightweight cottons, which would normally be too flimsy for bags. And using the proper stabilizer will give a bag, a bag, a bag great body and stability and help it stand up and hold its shape without the need for lots of other interfacings and stabilizers. But what if you're using materials that can't be quilted, like vinyls or laminates? Or what if you prefer a more tailored appearance without the distraction of quilting lines? In today's episode, we are going to talk about options for making purses and bags using either quilted or non-quilted fabric and discuss the pros and cons of each method. You'll learn what to consider as you decide whether to quilt or to skip the quilting and how to adapt a pattern to another method. We'll also talk about techniques to make quilting and cut quilting quicker and easier, how to prepare the layers and choose quilting designs, and methods for attaching soft and stable without quilting. So one important note before we start. I need to grab a couple of things from down here. Not sure how much of this I need, but we'll grab it all. Um, one important note is that the models I'm making today, pretty much everything that I've showing showing you today, is made with Biani Soft and Stable. There's, um, I don't think I'm showing anything that doesn't have Soft and Stable in it. Soft and Stable is a firm but resilient foam. It has a soft fabric lining on each side of the foam, and it's a sew-in stabilizer. So you're going to use it just as you would batting. And as we said earlier, using Soft and Stable between the layers of fabric 
whether you quilt them or you skip the quilting, allows you to do use a, a wide variety of fabrics. So here is a fabric that um, came from Free Spirit that is one of Kay Facet's designs. And I love his fabrics because they're so fine and um, drapey, soft and drapey. I can't imagine making a bag out of this fabric ordinarily, but by taking soft and stable and adding it between the layers when I quilt it, you can see I end up with a bag that really stands up and holds its shape. Occasionally people will ask us whether it's okay to use pre-quilted fabrics for their projects. And um, because the stabilizer that is used in those types of fabric is usually just a lightweight quilt batting. You can see here where some of it's extending out the side. This is not going to have the same structure and stability that a piece made with soft and stable is. So here's a small piece of fabric quilted with soft and stable between it. Here's a piece made with the batting. You can see what your bag is going to look like if you try to use pre-quilted fabric. So for that reason, I don't recommend using the pre-quilted fabrics. All right, let's talk first about using quilted fabrics for your project. I'm just gonna drop those in there and hope that was the right place to put them. So first of all, let's talk about the pros of using quilted fabric. And one of the things that I really love about quilting is the texture and interest that it gives to a project. That's what turned me on to quilting way back in the days when I was making quilts. In addition to the color and design, the quilting just really adds another whole level. And you can see I've got great texture on the outside. You can even see it even better on the inside where I used a planar fabric. I also love the fact that the quilting lines and texture that are on the fabric are more forgiving of any extra lines of stitching that I might add. So for instance, on this on the town bag, we do some lines of stitching here so that when your flap closes over the pocket, the pocket's completely closed. So those lines are going to be much less visible on a bag that's got some quilting in it than one that might not have quilting. It also makes any inconsistencies in stitching much less noticeable. Also, quilted fabric can be a little bit more forgiving as it can stretch or compress to fit pieces together and it texture, its texture makes it easier to hide any necessary easing. So the other thing I like about soft and stable is that it stabilizes the fabrics from side to side. And when I'm using quilted fabrics for a project, as I did on this tote bag, you can see that my lining is completely quilted to the outside, so I don't have a loose, ill-fitting lining. So on this bag, we've quilted our main and lining fabrics together. Here is an on the town bag that's made without quilting that has a loose lining, and you can see that it's going to be just a little more wrinkly and move around inside. It's not going to be held to the sides of the bag in the same manner. Quilting can save you time, especially if you have a long arm or mid arm machine, or if you do as I do and send it out to be quilted by check. You can just cut the pieces for the project from your quilted fabric, sew them together and bind the edges. So there's no need for separate linings, lots of different interfacings or extra seams. All right, so those are what I consider the pros of using quilted fabric. Here are some of the cons. First of all, quilting lines could detract from your design. So this is a, a bag pattern that we did when we were really into the texture magic phase. And we did texture magic on this flap that goes over the front. I wanted all the focus to be on that textured flap. Had I done quilting lines in the body of the bag, that would have detracted from that. So on this bag, I decided to skip any quilting and we just sewed around the outside edges. So I have nice, clean, smooth lines on the body and puts the focus on the textured flap. Also, depending on the design that you choose and how close you decide to quilt, quilting a project will probably take more time. And if you don't quilt the fabric yourself, quilting is going to increase the cost of your project. Also, depending on what kind of fabric you're using, um, quilting might make it harder to use fabrics like laminates or vinyls or things like cork, as we did on this bag, things that you don't want to quilt for. 
So what I would consider when you're trying to make that decision of to quilt or not to quilt is, first of all, do you like the quilted look? I love the quilted look, so that's why most of my bags are made with quilted fabric. And do you prefer an attached lining? Again, for me, that answer is usually less. Yes, I don't like um, loose drop-in linings, so I try to avoid those at all costs. All right, here are some pros to not quilting. So first of all, just like we showed on the Serenity bag, skipping the quilting can give you a smoother, more tailored appearance to the finished bag. So this is a set of our eye cases that we made using um, just cotton fabrics, attached them to soft and stable around the outside edge, and you can see I have a real smooth tailored look, same as I got on this Serenity bag. It can also save time and money because you don't have to quilt it, and it enables you to use fabrics such as vinyl, laminate, leather, things that wouldn't heal if they're quilted. So again, as we showed you earlier, we've made this switch back using um, cork, and we did a little bit of fabric. We used a, a fabric for the handles. We did a fa cotton fabric for the bindings, the strip that goes around here, but other than that, we used um, cork with soft and stable, and we just sewed around the edges. The other thing that um, knot quilting enables you to do is to use um, laminates like slicker. So on this little set glow and go, we skipped quilting and we just did a slicker on the lining of both the bag and the wrap and being able to um, not have stitching lines going through that maintains the waterproof abilities of that. So disadvantages to knot quilting is that fabrics aren't secured except where they're sewn in the edges, on the edges. So on this bag, we only have our fabric sewn on the sides here, so you might get a few wrinkles in that fabric because they're not as well secured, and because you don't have the wrinkles that are kind of formed from quilting, these are going to be more obvious than had you quilted your fabric piece. So here are some things to consider if you're trying to decide whether you want to skip quilting. First of all, I feel like it's best for smaller projects or projects like this that kind of have a curve to them. So this fabric, as it comes around and makes it, it puts a little tension on the fabric and that helps keep the fabric smoother. Also, if you want to add slicker to the inside of the bag as we did on these, skipping the quilting is the better idea or if you want to skip bindings and use a drop-in lining, then um, not quilting works great with that. So on this bag, again, no quilting. We assembled the bag on top of the soft and stable. We added the lining and then we did a binding around the edge. So what happens if you have a pattern that calls for quilting but you want to skip it, or one that doesn't call for quilting and you'd like to use um, quilted fabric? We've got some tips to share for that. So let me clean these, get these out of the way. I'm gonna grab these two bags. I'm gonna grab myself a drink of water. So this, these two little bags were made using our pattern Grab Some Grub 2.0. And this pattern includes instructions for making the bag either with quilting or without quilting. So if you want to learn both methods, this is a really great pattern to make because you'll experience both options. So we're going to walk through the steps really quickly today so that even if you're using a pattern designed for quilted fabric, you'll know the technique if you want to skip the quilting. So let's talk first about what's different between the quilted version and the non-quilted version of this pattern. So when we discovered Slicker, which is an iron-on vinyl, which I showed you for the Glow and Go project, it's an iron-on vinyl that turns any smooth fabric into a laminated fabric. And when we first discovered that, one of our first thoughts was, wouldn't this be great for the inside of a lunch bag so you could just wipe it out? But when we thought about doing that on Grab Some Grub, we realized that if we attached the slicker to the lining fabric before we quilted, we'd have all those holes going through the slicker at every quilting line, which would defeat those waterproof features. And if we waited to attach it after the fabric was quilted, we would probably have troubles with it sticking because it needs to be applied to a smooth surface. So the main difference between these two bags is that we recommend using slicker only on the non-quilted version. 
Both of them include soft and stable, which give them great body and stability and ensure that they're going to stand up and not be floppy or sloppy. Remember too that soft and stable washes beautifully, so you'd certainly be able to throw either of these in the washer and dryer. However, with Slicker, and I have discovered this, um, it's, it's designed not to be thrown in the washer and dryer, and after repeated washings, it does start to um, begin to deteriorate. So I wouldn't recommend a whole lot of washing if you're using Slicker in it. Just wipe it clean with a rag. So, if you prefer the quilted look, you can know, though, that you're going to get lots of long-lasting wear from this bag. The only other difference between the two is when and how the main and lining fabrics are attached to the soft and stable to prepare the pieces for the bag. Once that step is done, the pattern is exactly the same for both. So basically for the quilted version, which is this one, it's designed so that you cut and quilt two sets of fabric and soft and stable. And we always cut those a little bit bigger than the pieces that we're going to cut out of them so that if it, we get any shrinkage or things wiggling around, we've got room to cut them. And so we, because we assume that you're going to be quilting on a domestic machine, we try to keep the pieces for those sets as small as we can. And that's why we break the quilted pieces into sets. Quilting from more than one set also lets you chain piece chain stitch the pieces, which really saves time. And if you're quilting on a long arm, you can just skip those sets and quilt one large piece of fabric. That's going to be easier. It's also going to make better use of the quilted fabric. But in either case, the pieces that you're going to quilt are cut larger than needed to accommodate any of that shrinkage. So what you're going to do when you're ready to start making your um, quilt sandwich is you're going to take you're going to have obviously two sets for that. So you're going to have your main fabric, you're going to have your lining fabric, and you're going to have a piece of soft and stable. And you're just going to sandwich those pieces together so that your lining fabric is face down, your soft and stable's in between, and your main fabric's on the top, and then you're going to quilt those however you want. And we're going to talk a bit more about that process um, shortly. Then once you have those pieces quilted, you're going to cut the pieces for the bag. And for this particular project, if I can remember where I put those pieces, there we go, you've got three different pieces. So you've got one piece that forms the body of the bag, and then you have two pieces that form the two sides. So that is going to be the general process for any by any bag that uses quilted fabric. You're going to start by cutting and quilting the overnight oversized sets, and then from those pieces that you've quilted, you will cut the various pieces needed for your project. So for the non-quilted version, you are not going to cut or quilt those sets. And in the grab some grub pattern, it tells you exactly what to cut. But for a pattern that's not designed to include both a quilted and a non-quilted version, what you're going to do is just skip to the part of the pattern that tells you what to cut from the quilted sets. So in this case, it would tell you you're going to cut this, this side, this side, and this body. So what you're going to do then is find those dimensions of those pieces, and you're going to cut the main and lining fabrics to the exact sizes that are listed. So that's their finished sizes. And you're going to do that before you attach them to the soft and stable. Then you're going to cut out your piece of soft and stable. And to make things easiest, we recommend cutting that slightly larger than those finished sizes. So we go usually about an inch wider and an inch taller. If you're using slicker to make a wipe clean lining, you're going to do that next. So you're going to attach the slicker to your fabric and then once that's done, you're going to attach your pieces to your, to your soft and stable. And I've got a little example here that I can kind of show you the steps for that. So we've got our main and our lining fabric cut out. We've got our soft and stable cut a little bit bigger. And what we're going to do, the reason we cut our soft and stable a little bit bigger is that it's much easier to sew around this if our foot can rest right on the soft and stable. It's going to make sewing it a lot easier. So we're just going to smooth the lining fabric in place. You can pin it or clip it. Um, 
If obviously if you're using laminated fabrics, you don't want to use pins as the holes aren't going to heal. But depending on the size, you can probably just smooth it with your hands and start stitching. And then you're going to stitch an eighth of an inch from the edge all the way around this piece. I like to start with the lining because the whatever size side piece I attach last usually looks the best, so I'd rather have that be the main fabric side. All right, once you have the lining attached, then you can trim the soft and stable. And this is an important tip. You want to trim the soft and stable to the size that you cut the lining fabric piece. As you stitch on this, you're going to probably find that the lining fabric shrunk up a little bit as it was attached to the soft and stable. So as you trim this, you're going to maybe see that you've got a little bit of soft and stable sticking out beyond the fabric around the edges. It's not going to be much, but that's normal for that to happen. It's also part of the reason we usually cut the soft and stable a little bit bigger. Once you've got your lining attached to the soft and stable and trimmed to side, then you're going to flip it over and you're going to position your main fabric on that side of soft and stable, smooth it into place, and then sew around it an eighth of an inch from the edge. You'll do that for each of the pieces that you cut, for, would have cut from the quilted fabric, and then you just follow along just as directed in the pattern. Because from there on, the instructions are going to be the same for either method. So you can just follow the pattern as it's written. Keep in mind, too, that you can do hybrid methods. So let me get this out of the way and I'm going to show you this bag. So on this bag, we made it out of Pendleton wool and we didn't want any quilting lines to detract from, um, from the fabric. And so we didn't want to have quilting lines on the inside, but we didn't want to have loose fabric on the inside. So what we did on this bag is, hopefully you can see that, we quilted our lining fabric to a piece of soft and stable, and then we cut out the main fabric to the finished size, the lining fabric quilted with soft and stable to the finished size, and then we just smoothed our main fabric onto the back side of the lining fabric where the soft and stable was and stitched around it. So it gives us the benefit of an attached lining on the inside, but lets us maintain a smooth look on the outside. On this bag, let me get this one out of the way. So on this Bulmy over bag, we used quilted cotton fabrics with soft and stable for the majority of the bag, but for this side strip and for the flap, we used the alternate method to attach cork to the soft and stable just by sewing around the outside edges rather than quilting it. So we didn't want to have quilting lines through those, um, but we wanted to use the cork. So on this one, we used two different methods. So again, another hybrid method. So whether you're quilting or skipping the quilting, there are some tried and true techniques to keep in mind to sure, assure that you have a professional looking bag. So next I want to talk about how to choose and use the proper stabilizer and fabric, and also what causes that dreaded cellulite look and how to avoid it. So as we said earlier, we use and recommend Biani's Soft and Stable for our projects. So again, Soft and Stable is a firm but resilient foam. It has a softly napped fabric on each side, and it really helps your bag stand up and hold their shape. It's sew-in, not fusible, and we get questions all the time about when are you going to develop a fusible um, stabilizer. And we've gotten samples, we've tried it, and I have never been satisfied with the results, so pretty much my answer is never. And I wanted to show you an example of a couple of pieces of fabric that we, um, one of them we used soft and stable in, one of them we used a fusible foam stabilizer, and this illustrates the reason why I avoid it. So on this piece, I've got my main and my lining fabric attached to my piece of soft and stable. And if you look here, you can see I can completely pull the fabric away from the soft and stable. When I let go, the, the soft and stable is almost like a magnet. It pulls that fabric back into place and holds it in place. This is a piece that I used a, a iron-on fusible on. 
And I will admit that when I first ironed the fabric onto it, I loved the look of it. Everything was smooth and beautiful. And I thought, wow, th this really would be nice because I don't have to worry about pins. I don't have to worry about keeping my fabric smooth as I go. But what I was really disappointed in is after I had it sewn together, I threw it in the washer one time, and this is the effect that I got. I think you're going to be able to see this better on the back. And Jake, hopefully you can get it so that you can see. Um, this is that dreaded cellulite look. You can see the other side, the wrinkles better. So you get lots of wrinkles and where it pulls away in some places and sticks to the fusible in other places, it just really gives a look that I didn't like. I always say it makes it look like my thighs and I sure don't want that on a bag that I put tons of work in. I have seen people carrying bags that they made where they use diffusable um, interfacing and even though they have never washed it, just with use, it starts to separate, and pretty soon you've got lots of separations and bubbles and wrinkles, and I mean, it looks kind of like elephant skin. So again, that's why we don't use a fusible um, foam interfacing. We use just a sew-in one. Next, let's talk a little bit about fabric. So using soft and stable allows you to use almost any fabric even a lightweight quilting cotton, as we showed earlier, to make a bag because the soft and stable gives it such good structure and stability. And I wanted to give you a couple examples of large bags so that you can see that. So this is the largest bag in our Totally Trendy Totes pattern, and you can see how big it is. It is a huge bag. I'm going to take this fabric out of here. But you can see there is absolutely nothing inside here making this bag stand up other than that layer of soft and stable. So it gives you a bag that stands up and beautifully holds its shape. On this travel duffel that we made, which is also a good size bag, one of our biggest duffel um, bag patterns, on this one we used a cotton canvas fabric. But even with cotton quilting fabrics, it's going to stand up beautifully and hold its shape. So you can see nothing on the inside making that stand up, just the soft and stable. One thing that I do recommend is that you, um, if you are going to use a heavier canvas, you could probably do it for handles. You might have to change the method of construction a little bit, but definitely use a lighter weight for your lining and also for your bindings so that you don't end up with lots of extra bulk from those. On this messenger bag that we made, so there's, here's another example. Um, this is our MJ's messenger bag, and we want it to use wool and not interfere with the design of the wool, so we want it to skip the, the quilting. So on this one, we used the wool for the body of the bag, but then on the inside, we used just a lightweight cotton quilting fabric and used that for all the bindings and handles and straps and things like that to help reduce the bulk. So that, again, is MJ's messenger bag. So that kind of gives you some ideas for quilting or not quilting and how you would adapt a pattern. But as I said earlier, I really like the look of quilted fabric. So you will find that the majority of Biani projects have been made using quilted fabric. But keep in mind that quilting doesn't have to be hard or time consuming. So let's talk next about some tips for cutting, choosing designs, marking, and stitching. So again, and we've already covered this a little bit, anytime we're going to be quilting the fabric, we cut it larger so that we can accommodate any shrinkage. So depending on the size of the pieces, we usually add one to two inches extra to allow for that shrinkage or any shifting that might occur. We also recommend that you cut more and smaller pieces so that they're more manageable. If you can get by without quilting the great big piece, you're just going to find it's not, it's a lot easier. But know that you don't have to cut a completely separate set for each piece. So if you had a front and a back and two pockets that would fit on this piece and then you needed a long strip for a side strip, you could break that maybe into three pieces or you could do two pieces. You don't have to have one, two, three, four, five sets to do it that way. By, by creating at least two sets though, you can chain piece so that you don't have to start and stop and cut your thread after each row. I've got to get another drink.
So once you have um, cut your fabrics, then your next decision is how you're going to quilt those. Um, because depending on the design that you pick, you might need to mark the fabric before you layer it and start stitching. And I just brought a few of our Easy Does It bags today so that I could show you a few examples of things that we did. So one of the quickest and easiest ways to quilt is by just using straight vertical lines. And that's what we did on this bag, just straight lines up and down about an inch apart. This one was even easier because we, we just went with the flow and made wavy lines. So we didn't have to worry about keeping them straight or evenly spaced, and we just went up and down all the way across the piece of fabric. One of the designs that I especially love, so we'll turn this up right, is a crosshatch design. And again, you're just sewing straight lines, so it's still really easy, even if you add extra lines like we did here. So here we did lines on point, and then we added extra lines to the sides of them. Or you could put on a free motion foot and have a whole lot of fun with some really swirly designs. Just keep in mind as you are choosing your quilting design that the more you stitch, the more soft and stable compresses. So the more you sew through it and the closer your quilting design is, the more compression you're going to get. For that reason, I usually try to pick designs that have about an inch to an inch and a half between the lines. Although for a really small project like one of these, you can certainly get by with lines closer together. That's going to help reduce the bulk. So for, let's say you want to make a little wallet and you don't want to have a lot of bulky seams. Some extra quilting on it is really going to help mash that down. All right, once you've decided on your design, the next step will be to transfer the design to the fabric or not. On this design that I did, I picked a striped fabric for the lining and I quilted this from the back. So I just followed the lines and when you get to the front, I've got nice evenly spaced lines going all the way across. On this Easy Does It again, we just stitched random wavy lines all the way across so we didn't have to mark anything. But if you are going to do straight lines as we did on these, here are some ways you can mark those. So you can either get your piece of fabric and mark lines all the way across. So here's a piece that we're getting ready to quilt. Clean off my table a little bit. And if I was going to do a cross hatching, I could mark all my diagonal lines everywhere, or I could do as I did here and just mark a basic center line on each and then use the guide on my foot. So when you're quilting, you want to make sure you're using a walking foot and most walking feet come with a guide, not all, my first one didn't, but you've got a little piece that um, hooks on here, and then you take your guide and slide it into that hole. Oops, I've got it on the wrong side. So usually you have a guide for either side, so you can put on each other, either one, but then you um, put your ruler, I usually put the one inch mark of my ruler, actually let me grab a ruler so I can show you that. So if I wanted lines one inch apart, I would put this center section right on a line, and then, wow, I did pretty good. And then I'd take this and set it at the one inch line, and then I just tighten this. And that ensures that after I stitch this line along the marked line, then I can just take this guide and let it travel along the guide line that I marked and stitch a line one inch from there and keep going across. The other thing that you can do is um, use masking tape, and masking tape comes in lots of different widths. Um, so you could tear off a piece of tape long enough to go across your project. That tape's not going to come off very easy. Here's one that's, I think, an inch and a half. So if I wanted lines an inch and a half wide, I could take that and put it down maybe next to my center line and then stitch on either side of that and move that as I go. So lots of ways that you can do it without marking, and that's going to save you a lot of time. Another idea if you are um, have stencils is to use your stencils to mark designs. And normally those are best, 
are designed for more free motion designs, but I have a stencil at home that I forgot to bring today that's perfect for making crosshatch designs. And they have pounce um, markers where you just rub it across the stencil and you've got your design marked and ready to go. All right, so then once you've got your design marked, if you need to mark something, your next step is to prepare your quilt sandwich. And as we said earlier, that's made with our lining face down, our soft and stable, and then our main fabric on top face up. So I usually do this in several steps. And I, again, want the top to be the smoothest, so I usually start with the lining side. So I'll take my lining fabric, I will smooth it onto my soft and stable, getting all my edges as even as I can. And you kind of have to pat it and pat it into place. And then I usually put a few pins in to hold this. When I put these pins in, I like to put them at an angle going outward because I feel like that adds a little bit of tension to the fabric and helps it um, stay in position or helps it stay taut a little bit better. You're obviously going to take your label off of there too, but I'm going to leave it on so I don't lose it. So you get your lining all smoothed and pinned in place. Then you flip it over and take your piece of main fabric and put it down. Some people prefer to do basting spray for this, and that's certainly an option. I personally don't really care for basting sprays, and so, and I don't really feel they're necessary. The nap of the soft and stable is such that it really hugs that piece of fabric and it doesn't want to fall off of there, unless you're on camera like I am right now, and shake it a lot, and then it does. But it usually holds it in place really well and keeps it in position. So get your main fabric on there, pin that in place, once it's nice and smooth, and then you can flip it over and take the pins out on the back. As you do that, you may find that your lining um, moved up a little bit, so you may need to readjust your pins. But get that all ready to go and pin it, and then you're ready to start stitching. So let's talk first about how you will set up your machine for quilting. First of all, as we said, you want to use a walking foot if you're doing straight lines. A walking foot enables all three of these layers to move at the same rate, and that's really essential for preventing puckers and creases on the back side. If you're doing um, any kind of a free motion design, you're going to want to use a free motion foot. This happens to be the BSR foot for my Bernina. Uh, you might have just a foot that looks more like a regular foot that has a round opening. A free motion foot doesn't press down on the fabric, so it enables you to move the fabric more easily. We recommend using a 9014 to top stitch needle when we're quilting, and we like using Sew Fine number 50 thread. And a top stitch needle has a, an enlarged groove down the shank, so it keeps your fred, thread from fraying. It has a great big eye, which also prevents fraying, makes it easier to um, thread, and it has a really sharp point. Sew Fine is a polyester thread. It's very fine, so it doesn't add a whole lot of uh, a lot of thread look, it kind of disappears in the background and gives you just the great texture of the quilting. Boy, I'm so thirsty today. My sister made split pea soup and I've had it for lunch the past two days and it's really dried me out. But it was good on a chilly day. All right, so the other thing that you want to do if your quilting is set your length to a little bit longer, we usually do about a three to a three and a half on that length. And then when you're ready to stitch, let's say you were stitching this crosshatch design, we try to do something that's about in the middle. Obviously, if you started in the middle here, you'd be over to the side. So this one started in this corner. Actually, I would probably turn it and start there. So I'd start there and I would stitch all the way down. And then I would rotate my fabric and I would stitch an inch to the side of this and then I would rotate and stitch an inch to the side of this so that I'm going back and forth, back and forth across the piece as I go. You're going to quilt from the main fabric side if possible, although as you saw earlier, occasionally if I've got the perfect fabric on the lining side and it avoids me having to mark and I check my stitch quality to make sure that it looks good on the other side, I've stitched from the lining side more than once. If necessary, you can roll this piece up so that it fits under the harp 
of your machine, but it's really important that as you go, you keep this fabric nice and smooth and wrinkle free. Not just on the top, you also need to check the bottom. And that's the nice thing about using pins because you can just remove them and repin it as you need it. So after I've stitched about this far, I will usually take it out. I will look at the other side. I'll adjust the pins as I need it on top and bottom and then continue to go. One thing that's really, really helpful when you're quilting is a pair of quilting gloves. Um, these keep your hands from slipping. They really reduce fatigue. Um, this, these are made by machingers. There's lots of different styles out there. The one thing to know that whatever they put in these to make them grippy attracts the inks and the dyes that are in your fabric. So you know you're a quilter when, you're, you, when your gloves are dirty. And these have been washed. I mean, it's not like they've been used and they've got that. That's a sign that you're using them. So if you've got clean white gloves, um, at least if they're these older ones, I don't know if they've improved that in, since I started using them, but um, don't worry about them looking dirty. All right, so again, for really easy quilting, we would recommend just straight vertical lines, top, top to bottom, about an inch to an inch and a half apart. And if you need some help with that, our videos for Peacekeeper and Easy Does It, both of which are, are part of our Biani Basics series. They're free patterns, easy to do. Um, you're going to find lots of quilters or tips for quilting in those. And to find those, you just go to biani.com, click on the tab that says Patterns, that's about maybe a third of the way down your screen. Once you get there, scroll down to the section that says Biani Basics and watch those videos. But if you have a chance, I would recommend that you actually make both of those projects too. Because having the experience of sewing those really helps you understand how to work with soft and stable, zippers, mesh, and it's going to make it easier when you tackle any of these other by any projects. All right, once your sets are quilted, then you're going to cut out the pieces for your project from that quilted fabric. And to reduce bulk in the seams, and um, prevent your soft fabric from folding over, you're going to do what we call sealing the edges. I think I have a sample of that here. Maybe, yes. So this is a piece that I cut from quilted fabric, and you can see that if I wasn't careful as I'm sewing, I might end up with this piece of fabric folding over and my naked soft and stable showing. So the first step that I do as soon as I'm done cutting, and this is one of my favorite parts of the project, is I seal the edges, which just means sew an eighth of an inch from the edge all the way around. That keeps those layers together, it starts to compress them, and it just makes a huge difference when you go to assemble your project. You can do a straight stitch as I did here. I like to put on my number 10 edge stitch foot, move the needle all the way over to the left, and it gives me a guide to follow. I know a lot of people prefer to use an overlock stitch because that mashes down the layers even more. That's a great option too. Just make sure that it's less than a quarter inch from the edge because most of our projects are assembled with quarter inch seams and you don't want that to show. All right, another way to make Oh, another way to make better use of the fabric is to quilt the entire piece, and that's best if you do it on a mid-arm or a long arm. So for instance, on our Ultimate Travel Bag, which is down there, but you can't really see it, it calls for a yard and a half of fabric. But with careful cutting and just rotating one pocket sideways, you can get two of them out of two yards. So it's, uh, it's really nice if you've got a big piece of quilted fabric to cut your pieces from. I don't know very much about quilting on a long arm, but we did share a bunch of tips from our long arm quilter, Linda, in week 16 of season one of Live with Annie. Um, Linda shared tips for how she loads the soft and stable on her machine and lots of other tips. So if you want to watch that, if you do have a long arm or a mid arm, you're going to find that at just after the 55 minute mark in that episode. We, I talked to Linda this week and I've made arrangements for her to be my guest in an upcoming episode. She has so much knowledge and I know you're going to pick up some really good tips from her whether you quilt on a long arm or a domestic machine. 
I have also invited my good friend Kate of Knot and Thread Designs to be my guest on Live with Annie in June, and she also is going to share even more tips for quilting with Soft and Stable on a long arm. So Kate was one of my very first employees. She has made lots and lots of bags. She designs bag patterns, and so I know she's going to have a lot of really good tips to share too. All right, so that in a nutshell is quilting or not quilting your project. I hope you learned some good tips. And uh, again, if you have any questions, enter them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them before we close. As always, we love to see what you make, so be sure to, to send pictures of your projects to us. And don't forget you can win $50 in our monthly photo contest. So just go to Biani.com, click on the um, photo contest gallery link, and you'll get all the details there. All right, so Brooke has a few questions posted here for me, but I gotta have another drink first. All right. First question, what would you consider the maximum distance apart to quilt your piece, especially for larger pieces like on Ultimate Travel Bag? So I can tell you that we made a travel duffel that we used a wool fabric with, and we quilted along kind of major lines that were on it, but those lines were probably six inches apart. It, it really depends on how the bag is assembled. On Ultimate Travel Bag, you have a pocket sewn to the front. So your pocket's about 17 inches wide, maybe. You have a pocket sewn to the front. You sew handles on that go through it, and you do the same thing on the back. So truthfully, I think you could get away without quilting at all. You could do like I did, maybe quilt your lining to your soft and stable, and then lay your front fabric on and stitch around the edges. So, um, Maximum, I guess, would be the width of the thing. Two to four inches would also be good and would help hold the pieces together. How far apart do you pin the soft and stable sandwich? So it depends on how big it is, but when I was doing um, quilting quilts, they always said about a hand's width apart. So if I was pinning this piece, I would put a pin in each corner. I would put pins here, and I'd probably put one in the middle and one there. So uh, about a hand's width apart with my fingers stretched out. Could you spray a basting spray like 505 on the soft and stable rather than pins? Yes, absolutely. In fact, here is some basting spray that we have on hand. Uh, our friends at Odif gave this to us to try. I actually had said I won't use um, spray adhesives because they bother my lungs. This one doesn't. This one didn't cause any problems. I used this when we had Teresa Coates from Shannon Fabrics on, and she recommends using it when you're working with the stretchy fabrics like Minky, all those plush fabrics, and I found it very helpful for that. And what she had uh, had me do was get a piece of fabric and cover half of my, so for instance, if I was going to spray, um, to baste it to this, she had me put a piece of fabric here and spray just the top half, and then take my fabric smooth it on that side, and then fold this over, cover that up with that piece of fabric, and then spray this side and put it down. And that worked really nice with that stretchy fabric. I, um, again, I don't feel it's necessary with soft and stable because the nap on it holds it in place, but you certainly could use that, and I know a lot of people do. Would you ever use a zigzag stitch to seal your edges? Yes, occasionally I do if I, um, if it's one where I'm really concerned about bulk, um, and that works really well, just again, make sure that it's less than a quarter inch to hold those edges, or so that it's not caught, it's covered by your seam when you assemble your bag. Cork questions. Is the cork fabric washable, and how does it hold up with wear? I have to confess that I have not made a bag that I've carried um, for any dis length of time using cork. So I'm not the best one to answer that, but from what I understand, I believe it is washable. And um, how it holds up with wear, supposedly it's gonna hold up well. However, I can tell you that several years ago, I was teaching a class somewhere and somebody had some cork that they had bought and it was starting to flake off. So I think like anything, you wanna make sure that you're buying the best quality and buying it from a reputable person so that you know what you're getting. I know that Sarah at So Sweetness 
carries a lot of cork. Sally Tomatoes carries a lot of cork. And both of them have done lots of projects with those. Um, so they would probably be good resources um, to find the product and also to answer questions like that. Cork isn't one that I especially love working with, so we really haven't done a ton with it. When you use cork, do you still layer with the soft and stay? Well, yes. In the projects that we've done, we have. And I know um, Sarah has told me that she um, still uses the soft and stable as well. Thermal questions. Does soft and stable have thermal retention qualities? If you use that shiny thermal interfacing, do you quilt it with soft and stable? So soft and stable does have thermal qualities. So for, I discovered this kind of by accident. Um, I took all my staff one year to the Shakespeare Festival, which is in the middle of the summer. And it, it gets really hot here. And I thought it would be really nice if I took a bottle of water for everybody. And wouldn't it be nice if I also made a little cozy to put those bottles of water in so they were cute and they'd have something to remember the occasion. And as long as I was doing that, why not stick the bottles of water in the freezer so the water's really cold? So I took the bottles of water, stuck them in the freezer overnight. The next night, we got ready to go to the thing. I pulled the bottles of water out, stuck them all in their little cozies. We got to the concert. And at midnight, when we turned around to go home, all the bottles of water were still frozen, which didn't make sense to me because we live in the desert and that never happens. So I figured out it had to have something to do with that soft and stable. So the next day, I did a very scientific experiment. And you, you'll notice, too, that I, I always keep my, my icy drink in a little cozy that I've made that is a couple layers of soft and stable folded over. So I can have ice in here all day, and it doesn't melt. So what I did the next day is I took two bottles out of the freezer. I stuck one in my cozy. I set one on the counter. At the end of the day, this one had totally melted. There was water all over the counter from the condensation. The one that was in the cozy still had ice in it, and there was no condensation because of the, the thermal abilities of the soft and stable. So I thought, wow, wouldn't this be great to use for pot holders? I would not recommend that for that. It's, it's not that much of a thermal retention. I don't want you burning your hands. And um, so if, you're, if I do pot holders, I like soft and stable in it to give it some depth. But I also put that shiny um, Insole Bright or something in. And I think that quilting with it creates holes that then lets the heat through. So you probably wouldn't want to quilt. So I, if I do that, I start with a quilted fabric. And then I add the Insole Bright over that layer. Next question, do you use the same color in bobbin and upper thread? It totally depends on the fabrics that I'm using. And that's one thing that I'm going to talk about Linda with in depth when she comes on, because she's fabulous at picking colors and designs for quilting. Um, we usually try to match the thread to the fabric. And what Linda says is she likes to find the lightest color in it. And that's the color that she often uses for her quilting thread. She said, for instance, on this little piece, if she had quilted this with a dark purple, it starts to look like scribbles on there. And you can see that on the lining side, she used one here that matches the main color in the background, so a lighter thread. That does mean that you have to really make sure that your tension is good. And that's the other thing I want to talk to Linda about, because she's got some good tips for that. Um, but yeah, no, I try to match my thread to my fabric, unless I want a contrasting look. Um, so they're not always the same top and bottom. Do I recommend not using cotton thread? We like SoFine 50, which is a polyester thread, partly because polyester has a little bit of stretch to it. And when I started um, sewing bags, I was working a lot with superior threads. And I had a lot of masterpiece thread, which at that time was a two-ply cotton thread. They've now changed it to a three-ply thread. And I can tell you that I would sew handles and straps. And just the process of turning, them in, turning the tube right side out, I could hear threads breaking. I never have that when I'm using Sew Fine. That little bit of stretch accommodates it. So that was always my problem using cotton threads. And that's why I switched to Sew Fine. And I've never gone back. I do know that Leslie, who answers a lot of questions for us, um, has um, uses RFL thread. And it's a cotton 
40 weight two ply and she loves it and she if it broke and caused problems she wouldn't use it because she's very particular about everything she does so I'm, I'm not saying you can't use a cotton thread that's just the reason why I don't will embroidery thread work in quilting okay when I started quilting again and making bags I was working with superior threads and one thing that they did is when we were in their booth, the focus was on thread. So oftentimes we would use shiny threads like, um, what did I use on here? Like here where we did it for the texture magic. We would pick the threads to show up. And so I used um, their highlights. I used their rainbows threads, which are trilobal polyester threads. But a lot of embroidery threads are rayon and I don't know that they're going to hold up the same way. So I guess I would say give it a try, make a small project, maybe an easy does it, carry it for a while, throw it in the washer and dryer, see how it holds up and see how it works. The thing I do know about a lot of those um, shinier, uh, silkier threads is that they, they don't um, hold each other as well. So fine has a little bit of a, a thread um, nap on it like kind of like a cotton thread so to me it holds it seam better but a lot of those others will start coming undone if you cut your threads a lot so you've got to be careful with that too okay here are some random questions Brooke says can I use a knit if I fuse it to a lightweight stabilizer first I assume you're talking about using it um, for your bag and truthfully, if you're going to quilt it with soft and stable, I don't think you really even need to bother about the lightweight stabilizer because your soft and stable is going to give it a lot of stability. If you're using uh, it without quilting, like maybe on the little um, eye cases, here's one, uh, you might want to add a little, but again, I don't know that it's ne really necessary. Um, we didn't use any stabilizers on the the minkies and knits that we used for the projects that we made. So I don't think that's necessary. How is your quilt at home coming along? I was afraid somebody was going to ask that. My quilt at home is right where it was the last time I showed it to you. So I have had a lot of personal things in my life going on. My youngest sister moved here in February. Um, she's got some medical issues and it's been a challenge for me. So I have had lots of my spare time taken up um, dealing with that and so I'm looking forward to getting back to it eventually and one of these days I will give you a date that I'm going to have some done but right now it's like I can't even think about that so I look at it every time every day as I walk past it but um, nothing's happened my grandson has a birthday tomorrow and he um, wanted as part of his birthday present and in control and sewing supplies so he can have sewing lessons. So that's probably going to get me motivated to do a little sewing like that. But truthfully, keeping up with him and my sister who also wants to sew it means not much sewing time for me. So you might see projects that they've made, but probably not that I've done. Can I quilt on a domestic sewing machine? Absolutely. Any domestic sewing machine should be able to allow you to quilt the pieces that you need for most by any projects. None of them are huge, um, so um, very doable on a home domestic machine. Someone says, I would love to have a men's bifold wallet pattern with clear vinyl pockets for ID. Any chance of that happening soon? I can tell you that I have um, wallets is on our short list for new patterns for fall. I have about six or eight wallets that I've collected because I like features of them laying on my table. Two days ago that's what I was going to work on. Instead I sat down and watched TV. I found a new series on uh, Netflix called Queen of the South I think that's about the Mexican drug cartels which has tons of um, violence but it's really been interesting and a great escape when I go home at night. So, um, so yeah I, while it's coming, just it's going to take a while. And can you use a serger to seal edges? I know people do. I have to confess that I do not use my um, serger often enough to really know easily how to adjust the width of the stitch. And it says that you need to take out one of the needles, I think, to make a narrower stitch. As it is, the stitch that the serger makes is too wide. It would be, it would show in the quarter inch seam. The other reason I'm a little leery about using the serger, you'd want to definitely put the knife up so that you don't cut away your fabric because by the time you get to the point 
of uh, doing the um, sealing the edges. Your pieces are at the finished size and you don't want them to be any smaller. So make sure you put your knife up, maybe read your manual, see how to either make your stitch narrower or take out one of the needles so that you can do that. Someone is asking would, um, about how I cut two and a half inch curves using the circle ruler. I can show that really quick. That's not hard to do. Give me just a minute to find my ruler. So unfortunately, I don't have a mat up here, but I can explain the process to you. So when we round edges, I take my circle ruler and I align it on the edge that I want to round. And I just make it so that when my finger sits here and here, I'm touching the edge of the ruler. So I've got it aligned right in that corner. And then I just use my rotary cutter to cut this away. One thing that I can tell you is if you have mesh on one of these sides or another pocket or something, what I recommend most of the time now is to just mark that and then stitch an eighth of an inch inside that marked line so that you hold all those layers together, then put your ruler back on and trim it. Another question that Brooke has on here is, what's the difference between soft and stable and Pelon 77? So unfortunately, I am not familiar with Pelon 77, so I can't answer that, but I can tell you that Pelon does make a product called Flex Foam, I believe is their name for it, that is a, um, a, a, a fusible, or a, um, I don't know if it's fusible, but it's a, a, a foam interfacing. It's a totally different quality, not nearly the same quality as, as um, soft and stable, and it's only 20 inches wide. So you'd have to have three times whatever length you're doing to equal what you get with soft and stable. Um, I think it's a little bit thicker. They also sell it in a naked version that doesn't have the soft fabric lining on it. To me, that would be really difficult to use because when you get foam next to your feed dogs, it doesn't move. So you're going to have a really difficult time working with it. It's not going to hug your fabric the same way. You can see on here, uh, this fabric is only sewn around the outside edges, but you can see how it adheres kind of to the stabilizer that's under there. If you don't have that soft fabric lining kind of creating that magnetic staticky effect, your fabric's going to be a lot more wrinkly and stuff. And I just much prefer soft and stable. I think it's the best on the market and well worth every penny. And we talked a while back about the price comparison. By the time you figure um, the width difference, you're paying, even with a 40% off coupon, you're paying essentially the same price for it. Maybe even a little bit more for the um, Pelon brand. I'd like a bag for when I'm hand sewing to take with me when I stay with friends. What would you recommend to hold notions and threads? We've got so many great um, bags for that. A, a place for everything is going to hold tons of notions and threads. A case in point would work. Even a simple project bag would work. It really depends on how much you need to carry. I would recommend that you go to byani.com, click on the patterns tab, and we've got one that says, let's get organized. We have another one that's small projects and gifts. Take a look through those and see. And if you've got any additional questions, um, be sure and let us know. Even the thread dispenser sewing case is a great one. It really depends on how much you want to carry along with you. Catch all caddy would be great too. All right, let's go on to a few announcements. As we told you last week, we're participating in a nursery blog hop with Michael Miller Fabrics this month. It started on April 6th, and there have been some really fun posts already. Um, there was an idea for a floor pillow, a cute little churn dash quilt block for a baby quilt, and then another fun quilt and a little fabric block made with it. So our post is going to be live this Friday, which is April 15th. So if you want to read that and follow along, you just go to blog.michaelmillerfabrics.com, um, and you'll find it there. So the blog, again, started on April 6th. Links have been added as each blog post goes live. Um, so be sure and check that out if you're looking for ideas for baby showers or ways to decorate nurseries at home. Um, be sure to check that out. I right, gotta have another drink. We continue to be really busy shipping out trunk shows. We sent out four more uh, yesterday and today. So thank you to everyone who's mentioned our trunk show programs to your local shops. Uh, we recently shipped a 
Free Trunk Show to Rachel at Quilted Twins in Dade City, Florida. They were the third prize winner in our 2022 LQS contact contest, so their trunk show was part of their prize. And they are going to have models in display on display in the store until the middle of May. So be sure to stop in and check those out. Quilted Twins is a fabric warehouse type store. They have lots of beautiful current fabrics along with close out bargains. And uh, the owners of the store are Becky and Rachel. They're twins, so hence the name. Um, and they started the store and as they say, Becky quilts and designs and Rachel deals and finds. So Becky is presently in Poland working to help Ukrainian refugees who have been fleeing to Poland. And so Rachel and her husband Ken are here running the store. They are also working really hard to collect quilts and other donations to send to, Be to Becky. Um, there are so many displaced people both in and out of Ukraine and Rachel and Ken have been really busy uh, pulling that all together. I um, checked out their website yesterday. They have hundreds of donated quilts that are ready to send. So what they are asking at this point is if you could help with monetary donations for them to ship those quilts there. And I know they're working with Jaftex um, using his special rates, but it still costs them about $500 to ship a big box of quilts. So um, anything that you can um, help with would be great. And if you can do that, just go to the Quilted Twins website. We'll put up a link for you. And there's a banner right on the homepage for their, um, their relief fund. If you click on that, it will take you straight to a form for donating and it's really easy to do. And you can be confident that you are sending donations to a reputable organization who's going to get things right in the hands of the Ukrainian people. So thank you so much for any help that you can provide with that. We would really appreciate it and I know they would too. All right, we want to say thank you again to everyone who joined us today. We are going to be back next week at 2 p.m. Mountain Time with a really fun episode of Live with Annie. We're going to be continuing our bag making series and cover the next step in most by Annie patterns, which is preparing components. And I'm planning to kind of walk through the steps to make an ultimate travel bag. So if that's a bag that you're interested in or you just want to learn the basic steps that apply to many, many other by any patterns, be sure and join us then. And until then, happy stitching.